Who here has heard of GitOps? A little bit? <laughs> um, I, I think this is a great opportunity to talk about uh, some of those transformation processes. Um, and it's a really cool way that, uh, that GitLab integrates and um, it's a way to, to really shift things left in your organization. Um, there's been some discussion about uh, security scanning, how teams interact, collaboration. And I view this as being a, sort of the penultimate way to promote that collaboration, to break down silos within an organization. And I think GitLab is a tool that helps with that. Ever since it came onto the scene in 2011, I've noticed that as companies adopt GitLab, they're not just more successful with their technology. They're not just more successful. Uh, it's, it really comes down to how they're functioning as a group. And GitLab encourages uh, some really good practices uh, around development and how teams interact. So why? Anybody building software these days, it's getting more and more complex. I mean, just in the presentations we've had today, it's, technology is moving super quickly. Everything is changing. The landscape's constantly changing. If you're going to microservices, you might have 60 or 70 services when you used to have one app that you maintained. You're no longer building a product in order to deploy it onto a server running in an IDF or a back room somewhere or in a colo. You might be building 60, 70, 150 different services that have complex interactions that run on a huge stack of technology and infrastructure. And a lot of that gives us abstractions that make it faster to develop software. They make it easier to give value to the customer, but it's very complex. There's a lot of risk involved in maintaining and operating that stack. Really, I would say that GitOps comes down to environments as code and then adopting the, the Git model changing your infrastructure, changing your policy, your process uh, by merge request or by pull request. Uh, the term itself, GitOps, was coined by Weaveworks in 2016. Uh, since then, Google, Amazon, everybody's jumped on it. You'll go find marketing materials about this from all the cloud vendors uh, talking about how Amazon Code Pipeline or Cloud Build helps you move towards this. Uh, in my view, GitLab CI was one of the original products that made it possible to start to take an integrated view of the system and say that I can have pipelines, infrastructure, code, dependencies, um, even policies or approvals and start bringing them into a single location with visibility across all these teams. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Uh, Git is the single source of truth. You shouldn't be able to make any change outside of Git. If you are going to do something, you start with Git and you're moving from a known good state to your experimental, maybe broken state. And once you know it's working, you have a clean transition. You have one change set that you're able to apply. And that can include security changes. That can include infrastructure changes. It can be a process change. It can be a new deployment. It can uh, be adopting Kubernetes or integrating Knative. All of the automation is driven by these changes and really we're, it's moving towards that everything is code model where Git is serving as the glue to make these safe transitions and to make it so that you can move faster as a team. Uh, there's a lot of talk about development experience. Um, there's a lot of developers who are very demanding, you know, sort of divas in the engineering and IT world. Um, that's why people compete over the coveted engineering title, right? Uh, but one of the things I love about this approach is it's a, it's a big equalizer. It's not just developers who get all the awesome tools and, you know, network is stuck managing the Cisco switches. Uh, here it's a situation where as we adopt things like NSX, as we start using Terraform to deploy resources, everybody gets this equal view, equal participation. They know what changes dev is making. Dev's able to see what changes they're making. You can move things forward independently of each other. Uh, and that's really the, the key to the model. So when you adopt this, you should end up with reduced complexity. You should end up with a contextual view of what's happening in your system. 
Uh, it also makes it a lot easier to properly couple resources that need to be tightly integrated. Uh, in the microservice world and in, in development, we talk a lot about dependency inversion. We talk about um, uh, the like domain-driven model pattern. It becomes really obvious in development, if I need to run something and I don't have the proper class, the proper uh, data, I can't execute, I'm gonna get an error, my runtime's gonna fail. You go backwards, what happens if I try to deploy my application and I don't have the right version of the database or the right schema? What happens if I have a separate DBA group who's responsible for managing that schema, a separate security team that's responsible for approving changes to the endpoints and the security? Well, one little code change that touches a pipeline could end up requiring three teams to interact in order to release that code. And that change may take weeks to get released just because all of a sudden now you have three different teams who all have different processes, different tools, there's poorly defined handoffs. What we want to see here is all of that moving into one shared repository. So what ends up happening is I have a Java application, I may have Terraform files that define my infrastructure, I'll have GitLab CI configuration, I might have Kubernetes configuration, Helm charts, uh, local Docker files or Minikube specifications that I'm running for my project. And that means that if I'm in operations, if I'm a developer, if I'm, a, if I'm QA, I can check out that project, spin up my copy to work on, test my changes, push my code, see that it works and every, everything is good. My process is the same as a hotfix or as the rest of the development group in order to move forward. That also means that all of these people need a really strong version control system to see what's going on, to work together, to know what that change is gonna impact. Uh, and again, that's why I think GitLab is the clear winner. They're not just leading Gartner and Forrester because they paid somebody off. They're actually an amazing tool. And, and you compare it to the other tools on the marketplace that haven't really changed in a, a long time. It's, it's always kind of funny when you go open up Bitbucket or GitHub and you're like, this is the same as it was years ago. Um, so overall, if we're looking at a process, this is what that process would look like. And we're really trying to simplify. There's a lot of complexity, there's a lot of areas where we could dive in and talk about details and specifics. Um, what I'm trying to show here is you can have a bunch of parallel work streams safely. You're building out change sets. You have uh, small changes that minimum viable change that Brandon was talking about earlier, and you have a way to observe it, to track it, to know that you're moving between good states. So the model is as simple as if you have this set up, get checkout, create a new branch. It's your feature, it's your hotfix, it's your documentation, whatever it might be. Um, it's whatever's relevant to the, the product you're working on. Everything should be in that repo. It might be the database, it might be a QA test, it might be the infrastructure. As soon as you check it out, you're effectively getting your own independent environment. So as soon as you push it to the remote, you have visibility across all the teams and those remotes get built and run every single time you push code. So I'm not in the dark and nobody else is. Now, the contextual observability is important and I think GitLab does an amazing job uh, at that, where in these interfaces, if you're not on a project, you're not gonna see all this noise. You might have 45, 50 people working on a project at the same time, uh, but you're gonna see the stuff that you've contributed to, the things that matter for what you're trying to build. And you also, you, you get that environment right away, but you don't have to go look at it. You don't have to bring anybody else in on it until you're saying, hey, this is ready for a review, and you can open a merge request, and we'll, we'll get to that. So the idea is as you're working, because you have your own environment, you're completely safe to break that environment. Since I move toward this everything is code model, Hopefully that means my database is in here, my QA tests are in here. So I deploy the application, it goes, it starts running. Every change I deploy, if I break it, it's only me that I impact. I might have 40 or 50 environments running simultaneously, uh, but that's just the amount of work that's going on. That's the amount of potential value that my entire engineering or IT group is generating. Uh, this is also where all that automatic feedback, all the automated feedback comes into play. I can get security scan results right away. I can get um, just code practices, linting, the stuff that I need to operate effectively as a team. Um, when you do combine all this and consolidate it into one location across teams, you can start to do some really cool stuff where you check 
do we have a test for a feature? And then when I go and I write a feature, I say I have to have at least one test, right? So then I don't necessarily need to know the exact code coverage specification for unit tests. I can get to the point where I say, hey, if I'm on a feature branch, I should have some BRM style feature testing, maybe in Cucumber, maybe it's in uh, Cypress, whatever it might be. But you can actually put those associations together and say you're not getting an automated CI approval until you have at least one BRM test that is going in with this feature that you're releasing. So you're encouraging the practices and the culture that you have as an organization is actually getting baked into this process. And this will be unique for any organization. Um, I've in helping companies set this up in the past, I've had situations where we had 40 or 50 different governance tests that were really just ways that the team wanted to work together uh, that were baked into this process. And so, uh, you know, it, to start with something like the Airbnb style guide, and then based on the things that they learned as a team, they took that communal knowledge and put it in the repo. So when a new developer came on board, they got that feedback immediately uh, on those practices and it, didn't, it meant that the code reviews also changed focus, which we'll get to here. The code reviews, once you did say, my feature's ready to go, come look at it, that changed the dynamic, the culture of the company as well, because now it's no longer, did you hit these 40 items on a checklist? Did you use tabs? Did you use spaces? <laughs> did you use underscores, camel case, snake case? All that stuff is automated out. You're not thinking about it. You're not worried about it. The developer, if they push something that doesn't meet those conventions, it'll auto fix or it'll give them the feedback that there's something that they need to manually fix. And by the time you get to a code review, there's only one question. Was this the right way to solve the problem? And that's really what a code review should be. If you want to have a, a learning culture, if you want to focus on cycle time where you are saying, we survive, we thrive as a company, by getting better, by delivering more value to our customers, uh, then that's what you want your code reviews to be. Did we solve this the best way? What did we learn from this? What are we releasing? Did, do we have the right things happening? And there's a whole bunch of affordances and tools around this, uh, around this merge request model in GitLab where they pioneered it. Uh, before GitOps, I, I think it was probably a year before GitOps, um, GitLab said that they were a merge request centric approach to um, get and, and to uh, development. And a lot of these concepts have stemmed from that same movement. Uh, this is also where we can set up DNS and have those uh, explicit review environments. We can go out and get approvals with the APIs that GitLab provides. <laughs> um, and we can wire together a whole bunch of different tools uh, so that we're getting the feedback in the merge request with the right visibility, with people from marketing, people from the customer success team, whoever it may be, saying, yep, this is what I, this is what I was looking for. The merge request looks like this. If you are uh, familiar with it or not, you can wire everything up in GitLab. So in this operations model, I get, as soon as I make a branch, I have my own environment, I have a safe place to work and test, and then as soon as I'm ready to release that, the trigger is I'm saying, hey, I think this work is done. I open my merge request. I can start to do things like assign approvals. Um, I get all my pipeline outputs, all those governance checks, everything in a clearly visible place where discussion can happen. And we can do uh, a review. You can see all of your uh, different tools, the, the different integrations that are enabled coming together in this one place which is also another reason that this ends up being, in my opinion, the most collaborative way to work, right? You're getting anybody who needs to have eyes on looking at the same thing and in a reasonable time, right? Uh, another cool element of this is as you're, as you're seeking those approvals, you can not only just not approve, but you can actually block it with a discussion. So when we're talking about GitLab, when you go in and you make a comment, you can say, hey, this, this discussion, this, this issue needs to be resolved before we merge this request in. And that's a really powerful thing for security for senior developers where they may just say, hey, you know, there's something not quite right with this and we need to look at it. I need some answers before we jump forward. And that gets, again, the right people involved and it keeps uh, productive conversations happening inside your, your process. Um, this is just an example of 
uh, what a discussion looks like and how uh, it's, it's really awesome to be able to pull all this data into one location where we've got comments, we've got the issues, we've got the results of the pipeline, we've got a deployment that's ready to go, a link that we can click on to see um, what, what change is being released, the results of security scans, um, and you know, right away we get a good idea, is this something that's going to live or die? Um, the last thing you would do generally, and this is an opinionated, opinionated way of, of managing this, but um, if in this model, master would always equal production, right? And so that's your safe spot. That's where you know everything on master should be working. Um, when you go off and you build in your own environment, and you make these commits, you're free to break things. But in order to go to master, you need to have, you need to be passing all the CI. You need to have like a test deployment that has a solid change set that is going to work. And there may have been work from these other parallel work streams that has happened while you have been getting your work done. Maybe it took you a week to develop this story or, or two sprints, and now you're ready to merge a feature in. And so you're going to uh, maybe have had a couple changes um, on that code base. So you end up pulling master in, and you keep your uh, approvals, but it resets all the tests, right? So now we've effectively, we have a new code change. It's going to go through everything, and if it's good, then we can merge to master through the automated processes, and that's kind of the bastion. So we're saying if, if everything's good and it goes to master, that is prod, and that should be our good state. Behind the scenes, we're using tools like Kubernetes, we're using Terraform to make cloud API calls or maybe to manage VMware. And so uh, w when we push this code, we're saying this is the state the system should be in, and then all those automated tools are going and moving the system into that state. And that's some of what um, uh, Colin was showing with the uh, the deployment processes with auto the auto devops and then the, the serverless pieces are that same direction you're saying i want the system in this state and then the system tries to give it to you and you just kind of have these automated tools that reconcile the intent that you're expressing in the repository and what you actually have in your system um, and then this is where the Canary comes into play again. GitLab has some Canary features. Uh, there's also Spinnaker, which has been kind of the gold standard in the past. Um, that's really the last, the last test, right? If you, you've done everything you can in your non-production, your generated environment, you've got this change that you think is good, everybody's blessed it, and now you're gonna go out there and you just wanna have this last line of defense that when I deploy that app the final time into prod and it's gonna be my new standard, or it's going to go in with a feature flag and run for a little while. Uh, what, I'm, what I want to know is, do I have a big regression? Do I have something that I missed? Now that I have a production workload and production data, truly, um, is there something that we, we need to be aware of? And so that's that last line of defense where you release it, you see a 20% decrease in performance, and you go, whoa, maybe we need an extra approval before we release this thing, because our costs are going to go up hundred thousand dollars a month if we if we release this feature the way that it's written um, and s my experience is that as good as performance testing can be it's still never the same as prod and if you have an organization that's moving quickly you do need this last line of defense it's a complex system this gives you a ton of good information about good states but you do still need a way to do that final validation that what I'm putting in is not going to create a, a problem so you have some very heavy inspection for a little while when it's deployed um, before it becomes, you know, the last release, right? <coughs>